So we have what I think is really quite a compelling story here. We have type 2 supernovae, they have hydrogen in their spectra, and we see them directly associated with massive stars. We have a reason why a massive star's core might collapse down and form a neutron star. We see the neutrinos that you expect to happen in that process actually detected in the one case where we might detect it. And the amount of energy liberated uh, seems to correspond to roughly the energy that uh, a supernova has associated with it. So it seems about as good as it could be. Well, apart from a couple of minor problems, I mean... Oh, you're so fussy, Paul. Yes, I know. It's a good thing to be as a professional scientist. But <laughs> one other thing, of course, is the trouble we have getting these explosions to actually happen in the theoretical models. And the other problem is that it seems like half the stars seem to um, not explode in the form of supernovae, the more massive ones. So they've got to go somewhere when they die, and what happens to them? Well, let's talk about the models first, because they are problematic, but they are such hard calculations, and uh, I have someone in my group who works in this area right now, and the physics is really bleeding edge. We know they occur, and so I am confident at some point that the models real, re really will explode. I have no doubt of that. I'm not confident yet we have all the physics in them. So, okay, it's a problem, but at least I can see where the solution is going to be. Now, the fact that half the stars uh, that we expect to explode seem not to be there, that's an interesting problem. Uh, one idea is that we can see how hard it is to explode these, um, these stars from the calculations, and it might well be that they simply don't explode above a certain mass, that they, the, the stars collapse down to a neutron star, and material keeps on piling onto them, and eventually that neutron star is going to become heavy enough that the Schwarzschild radius will be outside the neutron star, and we're actually going to have a black hole rather than a neutron star. And we'll talk about black holes in a couple of lessons. That's right. And so those objects wouldn't be a supernova explosion at all. They would literally just disappear. So a star, a big star, literally disappearing. And an interesting star that is of the mass we're talking about is the star Betelgeuse, the big red star in the constellation Orion. Could you imagine going out one day and it's just suddenly not there? How cool would that be? <laughs> in a rather creepy sort of way. Uh, yes. So that is a possibility. And we are out looking right now. There are groups looking for objects that disappear. The problem is you need to be able to see the individual stars in a galaxy. And it turns out you can't do that with a backyard telescope, which you can find the stars when they explode. Instead, you need to use the Hubble Space Telescope that can individual, individually identify stars. So there are projects to go through and look at a galaxy and then come back several years later and see if anything has disappeared. It's kind of like the reverse of a normal supernova over there. You look for things that appear, now you're looking for things that are gone. But the problem, of course, is there's only a few galaxies nearby enough, and you're only looking at a tiny part of the galaxy at a time, because the Hubble Space Telescope can't see the entire galaxy. It's too small. So uh, it will, it's not clear whether or not this will bear any fruit. If we do it long enough, uh, it will. But the Hubble Space Telescope only has a few years left in it until it just gets too old to work properly. But there's another problem which is much less exciting. It's dust. If there's anything in the world that I hate, it's dust. Oh, I've always been quite fond of it myself. Uh, yeah, well, it just messes up everything I do. It's been shown that in these red giant stars, before they explode, they have winds of particles coming out. And in those winds, dust can form. You're a long ways away from the star, and it turns out you can get dust. And what's dust do? It makes things appear fainter in optical light, where we're looking for these stars with the Hubble Space Telescope. So the idea is that when we look, we take a picture of a galaxy and then a supernova goes off later, and we go back to that original image in the archive and try and work out what the star was, and we measure its luminosity, and from its luminosity we try and infer how bright it is. But if that star was partially obscured by dust, or even totally obscured by dust, then we'll either not see a star there, or we'll think it's actually a lot less massive than it really is. So maybe some of these things we're thinking are like, eight or nine solar masses are actually 20 solar masses, but just hidden by enough dust to bring the light down. 
Yeah, that is a real possibility right now. We cannot discount very uh, frustratingly. But there is a way around it, which is that dust transmits or doesn't scatter as much infrared light. Now, the problem is, is the Hubble Space Telescope is a pretty small telescope. It's not very good at taking uh, detailed stellar images of nearby galaxies. But here at ANU, uh, we've built a add-on instrument uh, for the Gemini Telescope, along with the Gemini Observatory, which uses adaptive optics on an 8 meter telescope over a big field of view, almost the same as Hubble's, so that we can take really precise uh, images of nearby galaxies down to the stellar level. And at some point, my hope is that a supernova will occur where one of those images are taken, and then we'd have an infrared view of it, and this nasty dust will essentially not cause us any problems. So the idea is just go and image a whole bunch of galaxies uh, near enough that you can pick out the individual stars at infrared wavelengths so we can see every star irrespective of the amount of dust and then do the calculation you just showed us again uh, when a supernova yeah. goes off there but this time hopefully we will always see a star and they'll be more massive and we'll start seeing if this theory is right maybe some new 20 solar mass stars that exploded. So I think we're going to be able to resolve this problem and it you know we have sort of an explanation each way it may be these things do explode or maybe they're just forming black holes and that's uh, you know one of the processes in the universe so I always like it when I can see a way through how to answer questions and that seems to be where we're at. So do you think uh, where do you think this field is going? I mean, we've outlined two ways forward to try and solve the unsolved problems. Uh, what else is going to be new in the whole field of supernova research over the next few years, do you think? So we have a bunch of telescopes around the world which have these huge field of views that allow us to find more and more of these objects. So we're going to be able to statistically understand uh, essentially what explodes and what it ends up turning into. And we're going to find some very rare objects. We haven't talked about it, but there are certain objects we think explode by a different processes uh, than making a neutron star. They become giant thermonuclear bombs, not quite like a type 1 supernova, but uh, a giant massive star becoming a giant thermonuclear bomb. And you could imagine that instead of having a 1.4 solar mass bomb, you had maybe a 100 solar mass bomb. Uh, these are what we call parent stability supernovae. Those would be really exciting and interesting explosions to look at, much more powerful than anything we normally see. We have a hint that those things are out there in the universe, and over the coming, uh, you know, coming decade, we should see enough of the universe to find what we think are very rare objects. Perhaps right at the dawning of time, uh, right after the Big Bang, because we think these big massive stars may have well been much more uh, prevalent back 13 billion years ago. And, for example, the James Webb Space Telescope might well be able to find these things in the distant past of the universe if they were frequent enough. They may be one of the parts of the first stars. Okay, so that concludes our section on supernovae. Uh, but if this theory is right, and uh, supernovae produce neutron stars, we should be able to find a whole bunch of these neutron stars left over. So that's what we're going to talk about next time.